I think that our first speaker will remind us that where we are, the land we're on right now, was inhabited for millennia by various cultural groups, American Indian groups. That speaker is Vernon James Knight. He's Professor Emeritus, former chair of the Department of Anthropology, University of Alabama, and Curator Emeritus of American Archaeology at the Museum of Alabama Museum of Natural History. He's an archaeologist, an ethno historian, and he specializes in the southeastern United States and the Caribbean. Uh, he has a PhD from the University of Florida, and his research centers on the social organization and religion of Native American societies in the late prehistoric and historic er eras. Uh, most importantly for today's presentation, he, has, he directed a 12-year project of excavations at Moundville. Uh, Jim has at least two publications available for you in the bookstore outside. Our second speaker will be Dr. Michael Panhorst, who recently retired after 11 years as curator here at the Montgomery Museum and for a while was director at Landmarks Foundation uh, of Montgomery at Old Alabama Town. Uh, he is the one who curated the landscape exhibition that you can see from Southern Shores to Northern Vales, Alabama Landscapes, 1816 to 1965. Uh, after this symposium and after this exhibition, he's moving to Oregon and will live close to uh, his wife Betsy's family out there. Uh, Michael and I are colleagues, we share a love of sacred harp singing and also an appreciation of the art of in, that can be found in Alabama cemeteries. Um, we are determined to stay on schedule today. So, so uh, after Jim's presentation, Michael will come on at 9.15. But if there is time after Jim's presentation, he will entertain questions and the same for Michael after his presentation. Okay, so without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jim Knight. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, the mic is on. Okay, uh, what I'll try to do, we're gonna look at some uh, slides together here in a minute, but uh, at the risk of being too professorial, I'll, I need to give you a little bit of background before I do that, and so uh, just, just bear with me. Um, so my job this morning is to, uh, <clears throat> is to take care of the first 13,000 years of Alabama art. And uh, I think the, the, the rest of the presenters can take care of the, the, the last 200 years. Um, so, but uh, seriously, the first thing I want you to do is, is, to, is to think about that number, 13,000 years of continuous habitation on this very landscape, not just in North America, but right here, even in this county, 13,000 years. Um, now, presumably during that entire period, people were uh, making um, objects that would meet the aesthetic criterion for being art, but unfortunately almost all of that is perishable and we, it doesn't survive in the ground, and we happen to live in a, in a, in a place where a combination of, of climate and, uh, and moisture and soil microbes makes the preservation of things like carved wood and basketry uh, nearly impossible, so we, we simply don't have a lot of that. Um, but we do know it was there. We do know that those people were making art because uh, there are places in peninsular Florida, for example, in sinkholes and wet sites where that material does preserve. Um, we archaeologists uh, tend to think of um, certain cultural climaxes or fluorescences of art during that 13,000 year span, and there are three of them that we, we talk about a lot uh, the first of those fluorescences was uh, between about, in round terms, uh, 5,000 to 3,000 years ago. That's what we call the late archaic, and that was followed then by the uh, Middle Woodland period of about 2,000 to 1,500 years ago, which was another both cultural and artistic fluorescence. And the third one, uh, was the most recent, the most recent prehistoric one, was the Mississippian period, which lasts in our area from about 
uh, 11,000 to 1500 uh, uh, AD. In other words, roughly equivalent in the old world to the late Middle Ages. And uh, it was during that time that uh, the, the large capital ceremonial center of uh, Moundville in west central Alabama was occupied. That is the largest Mississippian center uh, in the southern states uh, and where I've worked uh, quite a bit. Um, we shouldn't forget, by the way, that uh, there, there are still Native Americans uh, here in Alabama still making art, uh, but that, is, that has to be a topic for another time. So, so let's back up to the Mississippian period and let, let me just say a few words of cultural background before we get into this and also some maybe a technological note or two. Um, these people were settled corn agriculturalists. They lived in Poland thatch houses that were grouped by uh, kin groups into uh, towns and those towns were grouped into um, uh, settlements, uh, uh, chiefdoms that were, that were ruled by a chief. And you can think about those chiefdoms as being bounded territories that were uh, ruled politically by uh, a single person, a chief, uh, that contained anywhere from, say, 3,000 to 10,000 people. So during the Mississippian period, at any, at any one time uh, in, in Alabama, there were probably you know, more than half a dozen of these chiefdoms. And they were separated from one another by uninhabited, uninhabited zones, uh, in other words, uh, uh, barrier areas where it was considered unsafe to live. And that was because these uh, chiefdoms tended to be, if not at war all the time, at least potentially at war. So much of the politics of that area was all about war and peace. Uh, and again, it was dangerous to live in those, uh, those barrier areas. Um, society was ranked and uh, high status positions included uh, political positions, including the chief itself, and uh, those positions were hereditary. So they were passed down uh, not, uh, not patrilineally from father to son, but rather matrilineally uh, through, through women. Um, chiefs and their followers had uh, the privileges of high status. Those, those then uh, would be the nobility uh, as opposed to the commoners within any given settlement. And they had privileges, for example, like being uh, having the, the right to be carried around on the shoulders of their followers on litters. And they had the right to wear a certain regalia that would reveal their, their status. Um, so, so when you look at the art of the Mississippian times, a lot of it is, is about that. It concerns that, uh, that hierarchy, or at least it, it reflects that hierarchy. You're looking at uh, cults that were associated with the political class. But those weren't the only art-producing institutions in Mississippian society because you also set, had things like warrior societies and medicine societies, which were also art-producing institutions because each of those, for example, would have uh, a patron spirit and that might be reflected in art. So uh, the, vast majority, the vast majority of the uh, Mississippian art is religious art. So let me say a couple of words about Mississippian religion and that'll, that'll suffice, I think. Mississippian religion, as far as we know about it, was mostly about sort of penetrating an invisible wall and communicating with a large number of invisible spirits. Now, these spirits were of different kinds. Um, many of them were very powerful spirits who uh, behaved as though, were thought to behave as though they knew nothing about humans. They had no interaction at all with humans. And then there was, there was another whole class of spirits that um, were considered basically too dangerous to, for a human to ever make contact with because that would mean certain death. And then there was another class of spirits and these were considered benign enough uh, so that human beings under the right circumstances could possibly make contact with those spirits and petition, uh, petition their gifts of their spiritual power. And uh, so with certain kinds of rituals, certain kinds of postures, uh, smoking, um, certain songs, certain words to be said, certain places to be, one could actually make contact with these, uh, with these uh, invisible spirits for gifts of their power. Um, and that's what religious practitioners of that time did. That's what they were good at, penetrating that invisible barrier and making contact with those spirits. 
and acquiring that power, and then the, those, uh, those spiritual leaders could pass that knowledge on uh, to their followers. Now, in terms of art, that creates a certain dilemma because these spirits are sort of by definition invisible, so what do they look like? Um, and so there's a lack of consensus, that, and you can see that plainly in the art, lack of consensus on what these spiritual beings look like. Um, both you know, from chiefdom to chiefdom and even within a chiefdom, there's, there's no, no real, really strong artistic sense of what these beings precisely look like. Um, while I'm saying it, you'll, you'll see uh, images here of things like feathered serpents, winged serpents, and it may cross your mind that that's a connection with Mesoamerica. No, it's not. Um, Everything you'll see here fits very well within um, the belief systems and uh, religious beliefs and practices of the Southeastern Indians, and there is no evidence of, of uh, sustained contact between uh, Middle America, Mesoamerica, the Aztecs, the Toltecs, the Maya, and, and our area uh, during this period. Uh, just, just a quick note about the technology that you'll see. Uh, all of the stonework is uh, stone on stone. There were, and not all the shell work is stone on shell. Uh, there were no metal tools. There was metallurgy, metallurgy though, and that consisted of, of hammered native copper sheets, very thin sheets that were then embossed, and the technology of joining those sheets together was by means of rivets. They had a riveting uh, technology. Uh, as for uh, pottery, uh, the, the potter's wheel was not known, and so most of the pottery that you'll see is hand coiled. Uh, Mississippian pottery is shell-tempered, which means that the prepared clay is mixed with uh, pounded uh, mussel shell that's been uh, previously heat-treated to convert it from calcium carbonate to calcium oxide, which makes a better temper. Uh, so if, you have, if your eyes are good enough and you look closely at, these, at some of these uh, pots, you'll see little specks of white, and that, that is the shell temper. Um, all of this pottery is low-fired, and there were no true glazes. So. Uh, one other quick thing, and that is that I want to acknowledge my colleague and, and photographer David Dye of the University of Memphis, who's been uh, photographing uh, things like this for many years, and most of the slides that you'll see are his, are his work. And uh, I want to say that because without him, this would be uh, much, much less of a, of a, uh, uh, a lesson a presentation. So, so let's get started with the pictures. Okay, let's start with, uh, I, I'll, I'll start with several categories and just give you one or two examples of each category and then we can move on to specifically Moundal things. Uh, the category here is uh, ancestor temple statuary. These are, these are images of ancestors carved from stone. I'm going to cheat a little bit uh, just to show you, in showing you the categories and that what I'll show you is not necessarily from Alabama in, in terms of the categories before we get to Moundal. Um, these uh, temple statues are, are images of ancestors, and they come in male and female pairs. They're, uh, they're generally between about a little less than a foot tall up to about two feet tall. So they're, they're fairly large uh, sculptures. Um, they're generally made of sandstone, some of limestone and marble and some other things. Um, I, I like this one in particular. This one is male. It does have a female counterpart. Um, because of the expressiveness of the face and the lines that, uh, that appear at the, uh, at the edges of the eyes and uh, the cheeks and forehead and so forth. And the, there's even a little, uh, um, whatever that is, uh, I don't know what the anatomical <laughs> name for that is, but it's not unlike my own. Uh, <laughs> By the way, people, uh, people like me tend to say that there's no portraiture in Mississippian art. Um, but if there, are, if there are any exceptions to that, this would be it. There are a handful of these things that sure, you sure look like they might be portraiture. Um, and so feel free to disagree with me on, on whether that is or isn't actual portraiture. Uh, most of them, though, uh, look more like this with, with very conventionalized facial features which are pretty interchangeable between one, uh, one and the other. These are made of marble. These are, these are larger than that first one. These are from the uh, upper reaches of the Coosa 
river drainage. And uh, you can see on them traces of the paint, uh, the red, white, and black paint uh, that formerly was much more vivid than that. And uh, of these, the things that are, that are very uh, sort of diagnostic of male and female are the, uh, the, are the postures. The, the females are always kneeling just like that, and, and the males are either cross-legged like that or else they have one knee raised like the previous, previous example. Um, the, the, wim the woman there is wearing a, a skirt, as I think you can see. So that's an example of a, a male and female pair as they would be found together. Uh, keeping with sculpture, we can move on to a, a stone sculpture of a human in a, in a very deep crouch. This is a smoking pipe functionally, so in the back of it, back in here, that's the stem hole, and it would have come originally with um, a large cane or wooden stem that would be inserted into that, uh, that stem hole, and the, uh, the bowl of the pipe is in the back of the figure, so the functional part of the pipe is like this, and uh, it is, uh, it's in a position so that uh, when, you're, when you're actually smoking this pipe, you're more or less in the position that this figure is in. In other words, you're, you're kneeling down and crouching and smoking the figure as it sits on its, as it sits on its stand. Um, it's nude, except for, the person is nude, except for a very elaborate headdress here and uh, bands of shell beads on the arms and legs. Uh, you might see these in the literature called bound prisoner pipes, but that's a misconception. Somebody uh, decades ago uh, misinterpreted uh, these things here as binding ropes. They're not. They're, they're, they're bands of, of shell beads. Uh, look, changing categories again, we have some uh, stone discs. These are um, uh, termed pallets in the literature. Uh, and uh, they, they sometimes have decoration, as this one does, in low relief as a, uh, an OG design. Um, whenever you see these things that have designs on them like this, you're always looking at the back of the object because if you flip it around and look at the other side, and that's a different one, but this one uh, shows the working side of the object, the front side of the object, there's a working surface, and that, that circular area there is ground down a bit, and it's, it's a use surface, and you can tell by the uh, uh, typical traces of certain pigments like uh, white, red, uh, black, yellow pigments, and other things that were ground on those surfaces that, that tend to be uh, found with these uh, so-called palettes that include uh, specular minerals like, uh, like hematite, for example, but in, 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 in galena, which when ground uh, turns into a sort of uh, something, a substance that looks like glitter. Um, but they're not, they're not paint palettes per se because they also include organic substances uh, that, that really haven't been analyzed, so we don't know what, what exactly they are. A colleague of mine in North Carolina, uh, I, th I think very usefully considers these things as basically portable altars, and they were buried in sacred bundles, and many times you can see the imprint on them of the uh, perishable uh, fabric material that enclosed these as they were, as, and they were brought out then for use as, again, these portable altars for mixing magical substances. And here's an axe. Um, so m most Mississippian axes had wooden handles and stone blades or uh, that would be inserted within the, uh, and, they, and the wooden handles would look just like this. And the, uh, the blade portion then would be inserted in the wooden handle, or sometimes a copper blade would be substituted for that. Uh, but this particular example is, uh, is carved from one piece of stone, so the handle and the, uh, and the blade of the axe are all one, one piece of stone. We call these monolithic axes. And it has a series of uh, designs that I think you can see uh, incised. Uh, two heads that are joined by a sort of trailing ribbon-like element uh, the eye on this uh, head here has a three-pronged eye surround, and that is linked in turn to uh, a skeletalized hand, then to a forearm bone, 
and finally to a scalp motif. In other words, that is the scalp hoop. The scalp itself is that scalloped thing, and there are tufts of hair shown coming out in places, and there's a long trail of hair that, that comes down like so. So that is our monolithic axe. And moving quickly to uh, other categories, shell work and engraved shell work. Um, the shell that was used is, was primarily, or almost entirely actually, uh, a certain kind of, of whelk, the lightning whelk that's found on the northern Gulf Coast. These were cut out from the outer whorl of that lightning whelk and then ground to, to a flat surface and then engraved with stone tools. Functionally, this thing is a gorget. It's a, it has uh, two holes for suspension, and uh, they are uh, almost entirely found with women and children. Uh, they are many times perforated, uh, depending on the design. This one is a cosmogram. It shows elements of the cosmos, including um, elements indicating the sun, the earth. There's a looped square here, and then four uh, four things that look like woodpeckers, but don't think that they are. These are spirit creatures that, that take the form of a sort of a woodpecker-like being, a crested bird, uh, and they are in fact thunder, thunder, uh, thunder beings, thunder spirits. Now, take a look at the style of this one, and uh, I want to point out that there are there are more than a dozen styles in the southern states of these, of these gorges. And I want to show you a contrasting style now just to make that point here. Um, these styles vary geographically from place to place, and they also vary in time. So at different, at different times, a century later, two centuries later, they would, uh, the styles would be, would be different. Somebody in the 1970s decided that this should be called a spaghetti style. Uh, and I have no idea why. But uh, you can see that the central figure here is, is a, a human-like figure. It has a straight nose. Uh, the arms are S-shaped. They come out like this, and they end in a hand. Here's the other one coming out here. The, the legs are, it has a sort of belt-like thing, and the legs are, are straight. They come down here, and the knees touch this outer circle. Then the lower legs are, are flexed backwards. Here you see them. And uh, instead of feet, it's, the feet are substituted by, uh, in each case, two, uh, two figure nines. One here and one here. The other foot is where? Down here, same thing. Here, figure nine, figure nine. And uh, all sorts of other loops, that uh, most of which are figure nines. Um, so what are we looking at here? Uh, well, uh, the, the looped figures, all of that spaghetti, is we, we're pretty sure a convention for clouds. So we're looking at a being that's in the sky, a cloud being. And that zigzag figure coming from the mouth is a convention, we think, for lightning. So this is a, a cloud-dwelling thunder being, OK? And, the, and this, figure, this element coming from the back of the head that, that's bifurcated at the end it would take showing you a lot of these, but I think I could convince you after a little while that what that is is a headdress element that is a deer antler headdress element. So the point of this is that there are lots of styles of these shell gorgets. Uh, moving to uh, sheet copper, this thing functionally is a headdress element that would be added to a very complicated headdress, either on the forehead or on the side, and it's embossed. The thing is about uh, a square, about uh, about eight inches across. And uh, the subject I think you can pick out is a, a severed human head. There's, it's, it's set at an angle. It's kind of compressed and laterally. The mouth here, the open mouth with the teeth, the nose, and so forth. Um, the eye has a bifurcated uh, eye surround. Here, here's a, a head crest. The hair on the sides and back are pulled down into a sort of two-part bun. Here's the first part spiraling second part of the bun. And that other uh, circular element there is an ear disc in the bottom of the ear. And inserted into that bun is a headdress element that takes the shape of a feather, although the real thing would not be an actual feather. It would be a copper uh, headdress element in the shape of a feather. And here, there's a convention for serration. That's, that's, that is a severed neck at the bottom. And the other parts are 
arrow points, filling in the rest of the, the empty spaces here, here, and here. So there are a variety of cheap copper things, but I thought this was a, a good example to, uh, to present. Uh, now moving very quickly into pottery. Um, almost all Mississippian pottery is, are, uh, consists of functional objects. And so this thing is a bottle. It's, a, it's an image of a female. Uh, in a seated position, obviously, but, uh, but most of it is most of it is hollow, and the uh, there's there are traces of red and white paint at the mouth of the bottle, which is also the headdress of the of the individual. And, uh, and this is a particularly expressive one that has ears that are full of perforations, and each one of those perforations would have then a uh, would have originally had an ear ornament, which is a perishable thing. Now, um, more on the way of painted pottery. <clears throat> this is, a, again, a functional pottery bottle. I think you can see the, uh, if you can uh, mentally remove the head and, uh, and feet from this thing, you'll see that it basically is a, a teapot-like uh, vessel. Uh, with a spout, a straight spout that also serves as the tail of the of the creature. It's a, a, a mammal-like creature, but don't think of it as a real mammal. This is this is another spirit being. This one inhabits the uh, the watery beneath world, so that's indicated by swirl designs, a sort of uh, yin yang type of figure uh, con consisting of uh, red and white paint, accented by black on the sides. And again, you see an eye surround that in this case has three prongs to it here. Uh, and just to show you that such things exist, this obviously isn't a, a studio picture. This was sent to some of us three or four years ago by uh, someone who found it in Louisiana, and it is a wooden mask. Um, whoops, lost you. Lost your wooden mask. That is a... a uh, a wooden mask in the, in the, in the, uh, in the form of a, of a panther. And uh, you see, if you can see the greenish tint to it, that's why, that's why it, it survived, because it was originally clad in copper sheeting. Many of the wooden artifacts of the Mississippian period were, were, had, were copper clad with that thin copper sheeting. And the copper salts from that, the copper oxides, uh, preserved the wood. So um, again, this is so just something someone found in, in Louisiana, but, but shows that these things actually uh, did exist and, uh, and we wish we had more of the same. Now I want that picture of, there it is. There's Moundville. Um, just to start us off with a series of, of slides of Moundville, um, Moundville art. This is, this is an aerial photograph of Moundville that shows the, the sort of extent of it. In the, in the background here is the small town of Moundville in the foreground, the Black Warrior River. It's in west central Alabama. There are 32 known earthen mounds at this site, about 20 of which are large earth platforms with flat tops. Now those flat top platforms would have, would have had the residences of the elite and also uh, in some c certain cases, council houses. Um, these are not then burial mounds, they're, they're platforms on which there were uh, pole and thatch buildings. And the whole thing is surrounded by, or was surrounded by, a palisade wall, a fortification wall. And every 30 yards or so along that fortification wall was a projecting bastion or fighting tower. So these people were definitely concerned for their safety and, and having this uh, long, uh, long fortification wall completely surrounding uh, this, this settlement more than a mile long. Well, let's get into some Moundville art. Let's see what we can find. This, this thing is uh, currently on display uh, at the Moundville Museum there at the park. Um, although it belongs to the Smithsonian, it was uh, found at Moundville in 1905. Um, it, it's called a duck pole, but that's not a duck. You have to learn to, to sort of do that mentally. You know, when you see something that looks like a woodpecker or a duck, you have to say, no, that's, that, that's actually not what that is. Uh, these are all spirit creatures. 
uh, when you see this thing in person, the, my, at least my first impression is, is the size. It it's really is enormous compared to, uh, to uh, what I thought it would be like before I'd ever seen the thing. Uh, the base is more than an inch thick, and it's a giant, big, heavy thing that's carved from a solid piece of uh, a greenish metamorphic rock, and there's some debate about exactly what that rock is. It still needs to be resolved. Uh, but you can see why it was called a duck at first, because it, it has that uh, crest of a, that looks like it might be a wood duck. But it isn't. This is um, the, the being that's being depicted here is... Um, is actually a fairly common uh, being, another, another, another one of these underwater, uh, beneath world spirits that has the body of a snake and the head of a water bird. We call them pelamox because uh, in, other, in other arts, in, a, in other two-dimensional art, they're, they're most often shown as having the, the body of a water moccasin and the head of a pelican. Uh, so a composite creature, a kind of uh, dragon-like monster beneath world creature. That's what that is. And in, in fact, if you, uh, if we were to have a different view and could look at the back of the neck of this thing, there's a symbol on the back of the neck that is a snake symbol, just in case you don't get it. Okay, uh, more, um, more in uh, uh, carved stone. This is a, this is a pipe uh, in the shape of a human. And you're looking at the, the stem hole here, so you can imagine the uh, Again, the, uh, the, the perishable stem coming out here. And again, when you're smoking this pipe, you're more or less crouched in the same position as the, the person that you're then looking at in the pipe. The bowl of the pipe is in the back of the figure. And this is a good example of the fact that when you, when you see any, any large Mississippian site, uh, the, the artifacts found there are always a combination of things made locally and things that are imported from other places. So you have to sort those out either by uh, distinguishing the styles, which are different from place to place, or and or by, by geological sourcing, and you can do both with this one. The style of this, with its sort of almond-shaped head, is a style that was common in the St. Louis area, in the Tennessee Valley, or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, Mississippi Valley. And the, uh, the material it's made of is a kind of pipe stone that occurs in south central Missouri. So this was quarried in south central Missouri, carved in the St. Louis area, and made its way a couple of centuries after it was made, because we can also date these things, uh, to Mountville, where it was used and then, and then buried. Again, it's a nude male uh, with, uh, with an elaborate, uh, elaborate headdress. Here's another pipe, carved stone still. Um, so the bowl of the pipe is here. <coughs> you can't see the, uh, the, the point of insertion for the, the perishable wooden stem. This is in the form of a panther. There, there are actually several of these from Moundville. Um, they, they show the cat uh, on a plinth uh, with, the four, with the four paws draped over the front side of the plinth. Here we have the, the open, sort of snarling mouth with, uh, with large canine teeth shown. Uh, these are the whiskers coming through here. The eye has a three-pronged eye surround here and uh, on, on incised on the sides, on the legs, and the body of the figure are swirls. That tells you uh, something, that this is a, the swirls tell you that this is again a beneath world creature. <coughs> And another key to what it is is the tail, which you can't really see here, but begins in the back and wraps once all the way around the, the stem opening, then, then from there drapes, you can just barely see it, drapes up here, makes one turn completely around the bowl of the pipe, and ends up at the top of the head. So that's the end of the tail right there. Very long tail, uh, panther spirit being here. Um, so this wasn't made at Mountville either. The material it's made from is Glendon limestone that out, outcrops around Vicksburg. Uh, this thing you may be familiar with. This is a this is one of these um, uh, pallets, I guess, or tablets, round in shape. Uh, call, it's called a rattlesnake disc for an obvious reason. And again, you're looking at the back side of the thing. The other side is the working side. Um, what it shows, 
is uh, two snakes, which are horned snakes that are knotted together in two places that form the background or the surrounding uh, element here. The central element is what's often called a hand and eye motif. And although that is a hand, the thing that's in the palm is not an eye. It's uh, actually, we believe, modeled after a shell. Uh, you could uh, prove this to yourself by looking at all of the eyes you can find from actual creatures at Mountville, which never look like this. Uh, for example, the eyes of the, of the snake beings here look completely different than that. Uh, so it's, it's more a hand and shell uh, motif than it is a hand and eye motif. I threw this one in just to show you that they're not always circular. Sometimes they're rectangular in shape. And again, we're looking at the working surface uh, on this one. So you can see the, the stains and impressions of things that were uh, ground originally on that surface. I'll show you, show you a few pottery objects. To start with, a hooded bottle has a composite contour. Again, these things are shell-tempered. And, uh, and it's called a hooded bottle because this is considered the hood, and the opening to the bottle is actually on the side of the top of the bottle. And they, they commonly have ears as though, they're, uh, as though they're human heads, but they never have, they never have faces. We call them sort of this one, this particular kind of blank-faced, uh, a blank-faced hooded bottle. Now here's a, a little bit more common thing, uh, an ordinary hemispherical bowl. I think you can pretty easily see all the shell tempering here. This is a, a, a black burnished pot, which is typical for Mandel. And the way, uh, the way that's accomplished would be to, uh, to burnish, uh, first of all, finely shell temper the pot, burnish it before firing, and then at the very last stages of firing to uh, create a reducing atmosphere by adding a lot of uh, organic materials, say straw, pine cones, leaves, that sort of thing, so that the entire thing ends up being sooted. And the soot is, is really sort of soaked into the, uh, to the outside of the, uh, of the vessel, creating that very distinctive Moundel uh, uh, black burnished ware. It's sometimes referred to as black filming, but there's no filming involved. This is not a slit decoration, but rather just, just sooting. Uh, the head of this one is hollow, and inside of that hollow there, are inserted, uh, there were inserted during, by the potter uh, small pellets of clay, so that when you shake this thing it is a functional rattle, it makes noise. Here's a version of the same thing, although in this case the, the potter has added the, uh, the legs and the arms, so you can see that the, the concept is that the, uh, the, the, the body of the individual being shown is actually uh, the pot, it's the, the functional part of the pot itself, the bowl itself. And along the same lines, here we have the same, uh, same black burnished ware. Uh, but a, a standard Mississippian jar shape with, uh, with a collar around the top with strap handles on both sides. And here, uh, applied features indicate the form of a frog, a frog effigy jar. Uh, yet another form uh, with that same, same black burnished ware uh, of a shallow bowl with a large uh, flared rim, and the rim is on the interior decorated with a series of incised um, hands and forearm bones, very conventionalized in this particular expression. Uh, and that white pigment that's in those incised lines is, wasn't there originally. That was added by a preparator in the 1930s so that museum goers could see it better. Same technique here of incising using a blunt instrument. It's actually technically trailing uh, the mode of incising with forearm bones and, with the, in this case, a skull done in the local, uh, done in the, the local Mandel style that we call Hemp Hill. This is a cup shape, a small cup with a rounded bottom. 
novel archaeologists distinguish between incising and engraving, although that's uh, sort of, that, that's not technically right, it's both, both are incising, they're just done at different stages in the, uh, in the decorating process. The so-called engraved ware is never, never engraved post-firing, it's all done pre-firing. Uh, it's simply done by a, a, a sharp stylus as opposed to a blunt stylus, as you saw before. And uh, the dimples are also uh, very, uh, very distinctive of, of Mongol bottles. This is a, uh, a flat-based, a slab-based bottle with a wide neck, which is, which is the most common bottle form at Mongol. And I threw this one in just to show you that Mongol, uh, Mongol potters were not averse to uh, using the bottom of the, of the, of the vessel for, as a field of decoration. Here we have, the, have two opposing hand and shell motifs done by the engraving uh, technique on the base of one of those wide mouth uh, black burnished bottles. Now, a couple of different, more than a couple of different uh, supernatural creatures are shown. This is a typical uh, winged serpent that's uh, seen at Malmo with the U-shaped body. Here, a mammalian head, deer antlers, and at the tip of the tail would be rattles, indicating a rattlesnake-like body, and on, on the side in profile, wings with trailing feathers. There would be two of these on each side of the bottle. Same thing here, but a different creature, a crested bird, uh, showing you the front of it with its upside down, with its neck trailing down from the, from the neck of the bottle. Uh, the tail would be on the other side, and on both sides here, and on the other side are triangular wings. Uh, the mouth is shown open with circular forms indicating beads, uh, and a tongue-like tongue uh, element coming from those. I don't have time this morning to tell you much about uh, this or any other aspect of novel archaeology because that, uh, any other aspect of the iconography of these things because that would simply take way too long to do. I want to show, I'm more interested in showing you some of the forms and kinds of things this morning. And I'll end up with just a couple of painted uh, objects from novel. Uh, this one, a carafe neck or a narrow neck bottle with alternating panels done in red and white, these are, th these are slips. These are clay slips of, um, of red firing and white firing uh, clay. And finally, this thing, which is a square terraced vessel with one of the sides lowered as though to show you, to, to better see what's, what was contained in this thing, which we know nothing whatsoever about. But this is done in, in red, white, and black. Uh, and I'll just, it's done in a resist technique that again, I don't, I don't really want to go into the, to the details of how this is done, but it's done in, in, uh, in um, with, with, as you see, red, red and white dots against a black background, but it's actually technically um, red and black over white. Okay, so that, that's all. Uh, that, that'll, that's a, a survey then of, um, the kinds of things that we consider uh, Mongol art and in general Mississippian art. So I'm pretty much right on time, is that it? Okay, amazing, huh? Okay, well we can move right on to the next.